Welcome to the Marine Plastics and Petrochemicals panel as part of the Yale School of the Environment's Oceans and Climate Conference. My name is Mia Reback and I will be moderating our panel today. I am a second year Masters of Environmental Can Management candidate here at Yale School of the Environment, specializing in climate change science and solutions and energy and the environment. I'd like to start by thanking Liz Placencia, Shannon Bell, Marissa Grennan, and Krista Shenham for their help organizing this panel. Oceans and climate change are a profound issue, as Dr. Scott Doney shared during his opening keynote. And marine plastics are creating and exacerbating the problem in our oceans, as well as throughout their entire life cycles. We have three incredible speakers here with us today who can share with us their professional expertise about the role of plastics contributing to climate change throughout the life cycle. Our first speaker is Stephen Fate, an attorney with the Center for International Environmental Law. Our second speaker is Dr. Winnie Lau, who works for Pew Charitable Trust Preventing Oceans Plastic Program. And our third speaker is Raphael Bergstrom, the Executive Director of Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii. After their presentation, we will have a Q&A and discussion. So please send your questions through the Q&A feature throughout the presentations, and we will get to them at the end. The session is also going to be recorded and will be available on the conference website for everyone to watch after the fact and to share with your friends and colleagues who are not able to join us today. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Stephen Fate. Stephen Fate is an attorney with the Center for International Environmental Law's Climate and Energy Program. His work focuses on climate liability and finance, and he specializes in developing legal strategies to hold fossil fuel companies accountable for the impacts of climate change. Stephen graduated from Cornell University with a BS in Applied Economics and Management and has a JD from NYU. Stephen co-authored the report, Plastics and Climate, The Hidden Cost of a Plastic Planet, that examines plastics contribution to greenhouse gas emissions throughout their life cycle. Thank you, Stephen. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Thanks so much, Mia. And let me share the screen quickly. Can you all see that? Excellent. So hi, all, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Stephen Fight. I'm a senior attorney on the climate and energy team at the Center for International Environmental Law. Since 1989, CL has used the power of law to protect the environment, promote human rights, and ensure a just and sustainable society. And today, I'm here to talk about fossil fuels, plastics, and the planet. First, I want to start with what's happening here in the United States. Um, in the Gulf South, uh, ExxonMobil is building the largest ethylene cracker plant in the world. Um, and, and dozens of other investments in huge petrochemical facility, facilities are underway. The industry is looking to turn the Ohio River Valley into a second chemicals hub or cancer alley with massive investments there. And the US is actually shipping petrochemical feedstocks to Europe uh, to support an expansion in petrochemical and plastic production there. You may have noticed some of the names involved in this build out are familiar, ExxonMobil, Total, Shell, Chevron Phillips. And the reason is because plastic is fossil fuel in another form. Uh, about 99% of what goes into plastics are derived from fossil fuel feedstocks, primarily from natural gas and from uh, crude oil with a little bit of coal, but that's, that's rare and expensive and, and mostly just in China. Um, in 2017, we wrote a report fueling plastics, how fracked gas, cheap oil, and unburnable coal are driving the plastics boom. And the main takeaway was that the US fracking boom has made natural gas really, really cheap. And that is nice. There we go. And that is driving a massive expansion in new infrastructure for plastics and petrochemicals. This is actually a bit of an old chart, um, but, but it makes the point that the American Chemistry Council um, has announced over $200 billion of anticipated investment in over 330 facilities by 2025. 
By 2025, that means that production capacity for ethylene and propylene, the two platform chemicals for almost all plastics, could grow by a third, locking in a massive expansion of cheap plastic production for decades. But this is not an accident. This is the plan. The oil and gas industry expect petrochemicals, and particularly plastics, to be the uh, source of growth in oil demand between now and 2040. Um, with some estimates suggesting that as much as 50% of new oil demand between now and mid-century could come from plastics. So in light of this massive expansion, uh, CL partnered with a number of fantastic organizations to release two reports. The first, Plastic and Health, detailing the human health impacts of the plastic life cycle from wellhead all the way to escape in the environment uh, and everything in between. And then we released Plastic and Climate, which traced the greenhouse gas impacts of that same plastic life cycle. And so if you take nothing else away from this presentation, greenhouse gases are emitted at each stage of the plastic life cycle. Plastic pollution is a significant and growing threat to the Earth's climate. And the surest way uh, or stopping the petrochemical expansion and plastic production and keeping fossil fuels in the ground is a critical element to addressing the climate crisis. So that plastic life cycle is composed of, of maybe four main buckets. First, fossil fuel extraction and transportation, then production and manufacturing, disposal of plastic waste, and then ongoing environmental impact. From the extraction and transportation of fossil fuels, you get emissions from a, a number of sources, primarily methane leakage, flaring, venting, uh, as well as fuel combustion and energy consumption in the process of drilling for the oil and gas. And another often overlooked source of emissions is land disturbance, when forests and fields are cleared for well pads and pipelines. Um, and so this creates, um, or, or it opens up a bit of a vicious cycle. Oil and gas production is not the leading cause of deforestation, but there is a clear connection between the companies that come in to uh, clear areas for roads to, to get to um, oil wells or built pipelines, which then leads to logging and then clear cutting for grazing. Um, so this is a really critical part of that ecosystem and, and should get some attention. We estimated that in the United States alone in 2015, emissions from fossil fuel extraction and production attributable just to plastic production were around 10 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And then outside the United States, at least 108 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year attributable to plastic production. And again, these estimates were made with some pretty significant conservative assumptions. And so the true scale of upstream emissions is unknown, but is likely much greater. But the largest individual uh, source of emissions in the plastic life cycle is the plastics manufacturing process. Plastics refining is among the most greenhouse gas intensive industries in the manufacturing sector and the fastest growing. Uh, emissions come from cracking of alkanes into olefins. This is taking ethane and propane and uh, stripping off some hydrogens to give them a double bond and then stringing them together into huge molecules, four to 40,000 uh, atoms long. Uh, the, polymerization process, and then adding to that other chemical refining processes to produce additives, uh, dyes, colorants, flame retardants, plasticizers, all sorts of uh, things that go into what then becomes the plastic that you recognize as, as products or packaging. So it, it really can't be overstated. The production process for plastic is an enormous consumer of energy and therefore emitter of greenhouse gases. The United States um, industrial sector energy consumption by type lists bulk chemical as a quarter of all industrial sector energy consumption. Um, energy consumption being a pretty good proxy for greenhouse gas emissions. In 2015, emissions from cracking to produce ethylene. So again, this is just one of the two platform chemicals and just that first step before you string them together and add a bunch of stuff, released about 200 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent, a huge, huge amount from that one step. And um, the production impact is rapidly getting worse. Two of the larger facilities alone emit in, are, are expected to emit 
enough greenhouse gases to be equivalent to adding almost 800,000 new cars to the road. And these are only two large, but just two of among more than 300 new petrochemical projects being built in the US alone, primarily for the production of plastics or their feedstocks. And again, these figures don't capture the wide array of other emissions from plastic production processes. Um, and so this map, which is in our report, shows the potential greenhouse gas emissions from just the Ohio River Valley build out, which could be nearly 22 million tons of CO2 emissions uh, per year. But once plastic is used, uh, it has primarily three destinations. Uh, it either gets landfilled, recycled, or incinerated unless it's lost to the environment. Each of these produce varying amounts of greenhouse gas emissions, but the main uh, disposal source of emissions is incineration, um, which is exactly what it sounds like, burning plastic. Um, typically, um, incineration when done within a waste management system uh, is done to produce energy. So there's energy capture from it. Um, however, there's also a substantial amount of open burning um, in especially countries in Southeast Asia where the US and Europe and other countries in the global North ship plastic scrap. They're simply unable to process uh, the sheer amount of plastic being sent. An enormous amount of it is unrecyclable either physically or economically. And so they have to resort to open burning is the only way to manage what is truly mountains and mountains of plastic waste. So uh, open burning is a substantial source of greenhouse gas emissions. It does not produce any uh, usable energy and there's no, or I, I don't have a good estimate for how much it, the practice is emitting. However, uh, for waste incineration with energy capture, US emissions from plastic incineration in 2015 were about 6 million metric tons in 2015. And globally, emissions in 2015 were about 16 million metric tons. Uh, our friends at Gaia um, produced this analysis using three scenarios to estimate what greenhouse gas emissions from waste incineration with energy recovery from plastic packaging only could be by 2050. These one scenario, the best case where we phase out incineration, one where there's no growth in the ratio of waste incineration, but there is growth in plastic, and the industrial outlook where plastic production increases and the role of incineration in managing plastic waste increases. And they found that by 2050, incineration alone could account for over 300 million uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalent on net. And this is the really important part that these, uh, and actually I'll go back for a second. Actually, the way these figures are calculated could be done two ways. You can either look at just how much um, methane and carbon dioxide are being emitted from an incinerator and count that as the amount of incineration. Or because there's energy, uh, energy capture, you can calculate what the difference is for carbon that would have been displaced from the grid, right? So if you have an incinerator that's producing the amount of energy that a gas-fired power plant would have produced, then you can say, okay, well, this would have produced this much, and so now we're producing this much, so the net difference is, is this. And these figures are net figures, not absolute figures. So they account for that displacement, um, which means that as we decarbonize the electricity grid, the net emissions from greenhouse uh, from incineration are only expected to increase. So when you put this all together, this amounts to, uh, as of last year, about 189 coal plants of 500 megawatts running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. By 2030, this is going, uh, assuming the, the business industrial outlook, um, this will be almost 300 coal plants. And by 2050, almost over 600 coal plants worth of carbon emissions running around the clock all day, all week, all month, all year. At current levels, greenhouse gas emissions from the plastic life cycle could account for 10 to 13% of the carbon budget needed to keep global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees. And that's reflected in this chart to the right. And I wanna just point out a few things. I think I have, oh, I hope I have some time um, that as, as I mentioned before with um, incineration, as you reduce emissions from one part of the cycle, because 
incineration emissions are on net, you increase them over here. So there, it's really, really difficult to get the greenhouse gas emissions out of this process if you have incineration. It's also really difficult because uh, these facilities are not just drawing electricity from the grid, but they often have captive power plants on site. So even if you completely decarbonize the electricity grid, the industrial emissions are likely to stay um, because again, they're using that, that methane to produce the heat and energy to do these heavy industrial processes. So this is a real climate problem that is getting worse uh, and getting worse fast. But there's one step left in the plastic life cycle uh, and that is plastic escaping into the environment. And given this conference, I really wanna focus on plastic in the oceans. So plastic in the oceans may interfere with the ocean's capacity to absorb and sequester carbon dioxide. And the Earth's oceans have absorbed, you know, 30 or so percent of all anthropogenic carbon emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. The way this works is through something called the oceanic carbon sink or the biological carbon pump. Basically phytoplankton at the surface of the ocean uh, take in carbon dioxide or carbonic acid, um, then get eaten by zooplankton, which then through uh, either excretion or just death, end up sinking down into the deep ocean. And they don't all get there, but some, some amount of these plankton make their way down to the deep ocean, then freeing up the surface oceans to absorb more carbon. There's evidence though, that microplastics are interfering with this process, that they're, uh, they're making it more difficult for phytoplankton and zooplankton to both uh, develop and also reproduce. And so I don't wanna overstate this, but I really, really, really don't wanna understate this, that this is a huge climate problem as the biological carbon pump is a major source of, uh, a major sink for carbon in the atmosphere and then in the oceans. But phytoplankton and zooplankton also represent the base of huge amounts of the marine food web. So this is, this is really something that's quite concerning and about which we know some, but not nearly enough. Um, and as you can see, microplastics in the environment are everywhere. Uh, the, the, this heat map shows where microplastics have been found in greater or lesser densities um, and quantities. And you can see there are hot spots, but there is, seem, there is microplastic essentially everywhere. Um, and because of the nature of microplastics, their size and the difficulty of removing them, this is one of those problems that once we cause it, it will be really, really, really hard, if not impossible to undo the damage. So with that, I'll, I'll end with some high priority actions we can take now. We can end the production and use of single use disposable plastic. We can stop the development of new oil and gas and petrochemical infrastructure. We can foster the transition to zero waste communities, implement extended producer responsibility as a critical component of circular economies and adopt and enforce ambitious climate targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors. Stopping the expansion of the petrochemical and plastic production and keeping fossil fuels in the ground provides the surest and most effective path to reducing the rising climate impacts of plastics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was a very, very informative and helpful presentation to kick off this panel. I will now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Winnie Lau. Dr. Lau is a senior manager with the Pew Charitable Trust Preventing Oceans Plastics Pro Project which aims to propose strategies to reduce the global ocean plastic pollution problem. Dr. Lau holds a bachelor's degree in integrative biology and environmental sciences from the University of California, Berkeley, and a doctorate in oceanography from the University of Washington. Dr. Lau co-authored the recent report, Breaking the Plastic Wave, Top Findings for Preventing Plastic Pollution. Breaking the Plastic Wave identifies eight strategies that together can create the system change needed to reduce 80% of plastic pollution by 2040. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau, for being with us today. Thank you, Mia. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And let me share my screen. So, I'm really excited to be here with all of you today, and I'm excited to share the results of our report with you. Um, so the Breaking the Plastic Wave, as Mia said, is a report we recently released, and it is actually a detailed discussion of the implications of our research, which was also published recently in the journal Science. 
And as with any work of this magnitude, we had many partners. So first, I'd like to acknowledge Systemic, our close partner in this work, and our four thought partners, the University of Oxford, the University of Leeds, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and Common Seas. This work also relied on the knowledge and expertise of our expert panel, who generously shared their time and knowledge with us. Collectively, they represented experience across the whole plastics value chain and in geographies around the world. So now let me jump into the work. So in a paper published in 2015, so five years ago, in the journal Science, Jenna Janbeck, Professor Janbeck and her colleagues estimated that 8 million metric tons of plastic waste was going into the ocean and that it would continue to increase along the trajectory that the world was set on. However, as you just heard from Stephen, since that paper has been published, the plastic industry has continued to grow. And based on industry projections pre-COVID, the numbers you see on this slide represent the projected growth in production and investment in the plastics industry. At the same time, um, there were various groups that have been proposing different strategies about how the plastic pollution problem could be solved. And when Pew, my colleagues at Pew and I started looking at this problem, we recognized that there were different assumptions being made about what could solve the problem. And with the debate centering around five strategies, five main strategies that you see here on this slide. When we looked a little deeper, we realized that there wasn't really enough evidence to say how each of these would perform from an environmental perspective, economically, or socially for different plastic materials, as well as under different geographies. And it was also not known what the costs and investments associated with each strategy was. So we set out to conduct the research to answer these questions. And one of the things that was really important to us was also to look at the plastic system, um, plastic as a system as a whole. So what did we find? Well, probably no surprise to many of you, under business as usual, plastic waste generation is expected to grow and it's expected to double by, 20, by 2040. And as a result of that, the amount of plastic waste going into the ocean is expected to double in that same time period. And that would result in four times as much plastic in the ocean in 2040 as we're seeing today. So if you think things are bad now, it's not going to be pretty in 20 years if we don't change course. So we then looked at the different strategies and the top line finding I wanna share with you is that there are no silver bullets to solving this problem. The various single solution strategies that I showed earlier in a previous slide, none of them can get us to getting past where we are today. So the red line here, business as usual, the dotted line below, current commitments made by governments and companies uh, up to the middle of 2019, showed that what they have committed to could be impactful, but it is very far from where we need to be. And if we look at um, the single solution strategies where some groups have proposed that we could recycle our way out of it, or we could dispose our way out of it, just as long as we capture the plastic, put it in landfills, we'll be good. Or we could you know, reduce away some of the plastic or a lot of it and substitute into other materials, we could similarly solve the plastic problem. And as you can see, maybe at best, it'll keep us at about where we are today. Now, the second key finding I wanna give you is that there is hope. And what we found was that if instead of trying to do single solution, silver bullet, strategies, we implemented everything we know today the tech, with the technologies, the approaches, the policy options that are available to us today. We could reduce the amount of plastic going into the ocean by 2040 by 
and we call this the system change scenario. So the, let's take a look at what the scenario looks like. And this is a graph kind of parsing out the different types of interventions and actions that could take place to reduce plastic pollution. And the first thing I wanna say is it looks like it would be a very credible pathway to reducing plastic pollution. So we looked at uh, the interventions across four main categories of solutions. First is reduction, shown at the top by the purple, dark blue uh, slices. We call these wedges. So for the reduce wedge, we found that we could possibly reduce away 30% of the plastic that is projected to be needed in 2040. And it was by far the largest wedge we found. And we could do this through actions like eliminating unnecessary plastic, reusing the uh, plastic products, and delivering products with new delivery models rather than through single use packaging. The next category of uh, interventions is substitution to other more sustainable materials like paper, coated paper, and compostables. And we found that this could absorb about 17% of the plastic demand in 2040. Together, reduce and substitute make up almost half of the solutions we found, which is quite substantial if you think about it, if you follow the trajectory. In 2020, we modeled that there's really not that much going on in terms of reduction and substitution, and we would be growing that to 50% of the projected demand in 2040. Then, of course, you know, recycling is also a part of the solution. Um, what we can't reduce and substitute away, we should try and recycle as much as possible. And that would make, about, make up about 20% of the plastic uh, demand. And then, of course, disposing of what we can't um, re recycle. And that would leave us with about 10% of the plastic demand in 2040, that's still unmanaged. And we categorize them into three, three categories here, open burning, which Stephen talked about, and I'll talk about in a little more detail, terrestrial pollution and ocean pollution. So we can get quite a ways from what we might get to under business as usual, but there's still some plastic waste that we need to figure out how to deal with. Now, how does the system change scenario compared to the other scenarios from um, the environmental, social uh, perspectives? So from leakage, plastic leakage, I already showed you, system change scenario is much better, um, but it's also better from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective. In fact, it would be about 25% savings annually of greenhouse gas emissions um, in 2040 from business as usual. And then in terms of uh, job creation, there we project that there might be a slight increase in jobs. And then very important to governments and society at large, it's actually also the cheapest scenario to governments for waste management than business as usual or the recycling scenario or the collection and dispose scenario. So it represents the most economically viable pathway. Now, how do we actually get to uh, achieving what is under the system change scenario that we modeled? So the first thing is that government and industry need to work together to reduce costs. And this is a co what's called a cost curve. Some of you who know the climate change space might recognize this. So what we, if it's below the line, it means it's uh, a net profit. If it's above the line, it's net cost. And you'll see here that reduce and recycle, uh, reduce is by far the most cost um, savings or gain and recycle, maybe mainly some gains, some technologies might be a cost. Disposal will always be a cost because you're just putting things in landfills. And substitution actually is um, more expensive because the materials are expensive and you might have to build the facilities to manage the compostables. So I wanna caution that it's important to think about the trade-offs to when we 
use, um, do these different technologies. And then also, if carbon pricing comes into play, then the relative cost of recycling might actually become net cost. So lots of things to think about, and we need to make sure that we're moving to a system that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions as well as other negative environmental impacts. So the second thing that we look at was um, breaking down the plastic pollution by type. We found that flexible monomaterial, these are the plastic bags, the um, cling wraps that we see in the packaging that mm, a lot of our, the things we buy come wrapped in. They represent the biggest problematic category of plastic, then they make up about 50% of the pollution we see in the environment. This is 2040, but in 2016, it's the same. About half of the plastic pollution comes from this category of plastic products. What's also important to note here is you see microplastics. It's actually the second highest category of uh, plastic pollution. It a lower than um, the plastic bags and wraps, but in fact, between 2016 and 2040, even our, under our best case scenario, it's a growing problem. We cannot find any ways to decrease it under current technologies and knowledge. So I'll quickly jump through some geographic differences. So uh, you've heard a lot of the pollutions coming from uh, middle, uh, low income and middle income countries. And what we found was that that's the case. They consume about 50% of the plastic, but they contribute almost 90% of the um, pollution. However, that's not the whole story. What we found is that um, first, there's a collection gap in middle and low income countries. Um, about 2 billion people today do not have collection services and that's projected to grow to 4 billion people. And in order to co connect everyone, we're gonna to have to add about 500,000 people per day, every single day between now and 2040. That's a very daunting number. The second thing is that um, in these countries, a lot of the waste is collected by an, the informal sector, termed waste pickers. They actually collect more for recycling than in the uh, high income countries. And what we found was, you know, 15% of the plastics is recycled today. You've see, heard other numbers, maybe a little lower, but the bottom line is it's very low. And the reason is that plastic is collected for its value. The flexible material that I mentioned earlier, they have very low value, very difficult to collect. And unless we change what, how we use them, what we do, we're unlikely to be able to significantly reduce that away. And some of the things that could be done is, you know, companies switching to non-flexible plastics, increasing the use of recycled content, and all of these will be able to help us shift towards less plastic ending up in the environment. And the other thing I wanna highlight is that these waste pickers, they're some of the most marginalized people in society and ensuring that they receive fair wages and have safe working conditions will be really important in solving the plastic pollution problem as well as social justice problems. Okay, I know I'm running out of time. I'm gonna stop at the next slide um, because we're on the climate change conference. The other thing I wanna highlight is that we, um, open burning, as Stephen mentioned earlier, is a big issue. It is. It was actually by far the largest category of mismanaged waste we found, even bigger than the amount of plastic we projected to be entering land and sea. And openly burned plastic uh, comes because in the middle and low income countries, people do not have access to proper waste management. And as a result, they treat waste by openly burning them in uncontrolled settings. And that, that creates, um, releases greenhouse gases and other harmful toxic chemicals into the environment and could harm human health. So I'm gonna skip to the end, um, but I have lots more to say, but I do wanna leave you with um, a key message, which is, 
we do have the solutions today to substantially reduce plastic pollution. And every single one of us, companies, governments, industry, civil society, scientists, we all have a role. And if we do all put in our efforts, we could solve this problem within a generation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau. That was great. Our next speaker is Rafael Bergstrom. He is the Executive Director of Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, a nonprofit organization that inspires communities to care for their beaches. Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii coordinates hands-on beach cleanups, educational programs, waste diversion services, and public awareness campaigns to prevent ocean plastics. Through their cleanups, Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii has organized over 30,000 people to help remove half a million pounds of plastic pollution from the ocean. Rafael has a master's of science focused in natural resources and environmental management from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me and what an honor to be on this panel, Dr. Lau and Steven. Uh, your work inspires the actions that we take out here in Hawaii. Um, where it's very early morning right now, the sun is just coming up. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to be here and I'll go ahead and share my screen. That coming through? Beautiful. Okay, so uh, as Winnie mentioned, or sorry, as Mia mentioned, um, Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii is a nonprofit here that inspires local communities to care for their coastlines. And we do that with hands on beach cleanups, but more importantly, through the education aspect that the beach cleanups bring about. And I'm going to start off by just talking about how Hawaii is this microcosm for the problems that were just discussed. And thank you, Stephen and Dr. Lau, because normally I have to start with all the problems in my uh, talk. This time I get to really focus on some of the solutions and the work that we're doing to excite people and inspire people. Um, I'll start with a little bit of the issues here. Uh, Hawaii really is this place where the plastic problems of our ocean sits on our doorstep. And the North Pacific gyre swirls around in the ocean between all these continents and ends up here. And that's a combination of the, the trade winds and the currents that exist in the ocean. And our beaches get inundated with the world's plastic pollution and with our own plastic pollution. So some of the pictures that you see down in this corner, this is a, a beach on Molokai, uh, one of the most remote places in our islands. And yet it is covered in plastic constantly. In one cleanup, Two years ago, we cleaned 40,000 pounds of plastic off of those beaches in just a day with a few hundred volunteers. So as I said, we are seeing this come to our shores constantly. The inspiring part is that Hawaii also has the solutions at its fingertips. And we are a model of a indigenous community that has understood the connections throughout. We call it from Mauka to Makai, from mountain to, to ocean. And the Ahupua'a system of Hawaii really focused in on that, that we are all connected in this together. And each one of our actions upstream have impacts downstream. And that is part of the problem, but it is also a huge piece of the opportunity for solution too. The other piece about Hawaii is we are a extraordinary life center in the ocean. We have amazing biodiversity. 25% of the creatures that exist on our reefs are endemic to Hawaii, meaning they only exist here. We have life from corals all the way up the all the way up the food chain to some of the megafauna of the ocean, um, and it it's truly a place that brings people to see it, to experience it. It is a source of food, it is a source of recreation, it is a source of joy. So we have it right in our face. It, it gives us the inspiration to want to protect it too. So just a quick picture too, Stephen talked a little bit about microplastics. And in addition to that large scale debris that comes to Hawaii, this is what exists on our windward beaches, windward meaning our Eastern facing shores every day. There, the sand is littered with these tiny, tiny pieces of plastic to the point sometimes where you can barely see the sand or the lava rock underneath your feet. And it also exists in the water column as you can see here. So, 
that's the bad news. Uh, the good news is from our perspective, what Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii is doing is also showing the solutions that Dr. Lau talked about across the board. We have taken on the idea that we have to work on this from every single aspect in order to make the change that is going to help stop this problem at its source. So let me go over what Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii does. We have a multifaceted program and it starts with our beach cleanups. And Kahi Picaro, who was the founder of Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii, along with a very close group of friends sitting around in their living room, realizing they had to take action on this issue because their home beaches were getting polluted. They realized that the beach cleanup is a way to build community. And it is one of the reactive solutions that we do. Uh, Dr. Lau and, and her team talk about this, that it is one of the necessities. We are going to have to clean this up uh, if we want to get these things out of our environment. However, that is not the end. We can't just be cleaning up or we'll be cleaning up for the rest of our lives unless we work on this at the source. So what the beach cleanups do is we throw the biggest, most fun beach cleanups that you can possibly imagine. We get community together and ideally we accidentally educate everybody who's there. They may have come there to clean a beach, but in the end they realize that the solutions lie in their own hands when they go home. And that's the point of the beach cleanup. And in doing so, we've still cleaned up half a million pounds of plastic uh, from Hawaii. Our second program that I wanna talk about is called Sustain Events. And it's a waste diversion program where we work directly with businesses. Our most successful program has been at the Triple Crown of Surfing, working with Vans and the WSL. And we talk to the businesses before an event starts and ask them to think about the single use plastic use that they have, reduce that. But we also set up waste diversion stations at the event where we are separating out the plastics that are recyclable, that that is trash and the compost. And in doing so, in talking with the attendees, we also get to have conversations about why that is so important. And again, where it can be reduced at the start. We also talk about this idea as waste as a resource. Thing like, things like food waste, which oftentimes we end up incinerating here in Hawaii, could easily be turned into compost. If we compost more, we grow more local food, we have less import of plastic wrapped food that's coming into our islands that we then have to deal with on the back end too. So it's a really cool opportunity to work with businesses in the beginning. Another piece of our program uh, schedule is our education and outreach team. And this is an amazing program where we are in classrooms almost daily, not currently. Um, we're trying to do as much virtual learning as we can right now and hopefully get back in the classrooms. But we've connected with over 45,000 students across Hawaii in classrooms alone. In addition, we're at events, doing outreach uh, discussions about the issues. Again, trying to get to the point that this has got to be worked on at the source. And that brings me to the last pro pro programmatic thing and the idea of turning off the tap. We talk about that, like stopping plastic, we have to think about it as bailing out of bath water while the, uh, while the faucet is still running. That's how we're doing it right now. We're cleaning, we're cleaning, we're cleaning. The tap's still going, but we have to find the key to actually go back and turn off that tap so that we can clean up and have it not be continuing to come in. And that happens from grassroots all the way up to policy levels. So now I'm gonna get into a little detail about how that is done on each one of those levels. And this is what I like to think of as breaking the plastic wave in practice. We are working on this across the spectrum. And Again, I'll start, the, one of the most important things that we do at Sustainable Coastlands Hawaii is build community. The picture that you see on the, on the left is of a beach cleanup that we thought we were gonna have 200 people show up to and we had 950 people show up at a beach park. And it's because we've generated a buzz around it, but we're able to do a lot of that removal because we have so much community coming together and wanting to not just clean up, but actually interact with each other as humans. Another piece that I think Kahi, our founder, was, was really good at was the cool factor. We at Sustainable Coastlines understand that in order to bring people into this, it cannot just be a don't do this, don't do that, our worlds are doomed. We can't do that. We can tell that story within it, but we also have to make it fun and exciting. And we've been able to do that through really strong social media campaigns and also connecting outside of just Hawaii. So the image there is Jason Momoa, Aquaman, on the Ellen DeGeneres show. He threw axes at targets to 
bring attention to how bad plastic water bottles are. And he ended up donating back to Sustainable Coastlands Hawaii. And again, expanding, we went from having our 90,000 followers through social media to then reaching 20 million people through the followings of both Ellen and Jason Momoa. So that power of translating this energy through excitement really makes a huge difference because we have to get the curve to switch in our, in our population. We need the pressure to come from our communities to say these changes need to happen. That pressure on the businesses, on the fossil fuel companies comes because people are excited about the change. Another piece that we work on is the policy side. So Hawaii passed Bill 40, which is one of the strongest single use plastic bills in the nation. It eliminates polystyrene foam, straws, utensils, different containers. And, but what we talk about oftentimes is that was a moment in time last year in December, this happened, we passed it, yay, good work. But the real story behind that is this was 10 years in the making. I've been sitting in hearing rooms at the state capitol, at our city hall for almost a decade dealing with having to navigate an industry, the American Chemistry Council, lobbyists coming in, and in apathy to change. So the connection into policy here is, again, going back to community, what happened with Bill 40 is the community showed up in force. The picture here shows a, a full council room because we actually had students coming in, we had nonprofit representatives come in, and just everyday people who had been to our beach cleanups were saying, we have to put a stop to this. And ultimately that led to the success of passing policy. There's still a lot more work to be done. I'm actually sitting on the state plastic source re reduction working group, which we're using breaking the plastic wave to try and urge our decision makers forward that this has to be done in this multifaceted way. Another piece of the puzzle is that Sustainable Coastlines focuses on is science and litigation. So uh, Sarah Jean, Jean Royer, who I think Stephen mentioned uh, about the off-gassing of plastic in the environment. It's off-gassing methane as it interacts with the sun. That came from a study here at University of Hawaii that was done by one of our volunteers and is now published and used um, to help understand more of this greenhouse gas life cycle of plastics. So we have volunteers within our ranks who are doing that hard science work and then translating it to the public. And what ends up happening is this last year, we also sued the Environmental Protection Agency here in Hawaii with the Center for Biological Diversity not because we don't like them, but because we think that they need to be better. And the lawsuit was focused on plastics being added as a pollutant to the Clean Water Act because we have beaches that are impaired. And we were able to do that because studies showed that our beaches are impaired because we've done surveys on them uh, showing the accumulation of plastic and how toxic it is for our environment. So that's moving forward. And now our Department of Health is actually having to act and make changes to how they implement the Clean Water Act. That can happen anywhere and everywhere in this country and hopefully more in international law as well. The last piece that I wanna talk about is some of the fun part of this too. There's an opportunity to use art and education to inspire. The picture that you see there, uh, Ethan Estes made a wave out of marine debris ropes that we collected at our beach cleanups. That was at the, the Pipe Masters during the Triple Crown of Surfing. Kelly Slater was in there surfing with it. And again, it's bringing that funness to this in order to get people to say, what is that, what is that wave made out of? What is the problem with fishing debris? Why is that washing up in, on Hawaii's beaches? And it triggers conversations. It gets more of the community involved in understanding where the action needs to come. Another program that we did that's also part of this community-based social marketing, which basically is the idea of making things cool so that your neighbor says, oh, what are you doing there? I wanna do that too. We started this program called Clean Beaches Start at Home where we're doing challenges every week to get people to realize small swaps in their daily life, whether that's your water bottle, your bag, your utensils. When, they, when we all do them, they add up to the change because not only are we reducing the single use plastics, but we're also pushing on the businesses who are supplying them that we don't want them anymore. And that is going to be a huge piece. We, get, we have to change the way that we demand things. And we have to say, we don't want the things that we use once and throw away. And that comes from us. And that comes from an individual action that can expand way beyond just the individual. So with that, 
I just want to say you can follow along with Sustainable Coastlands Hawaii. Here's some of our, our tags for social media, our, our website. And I want to emphasize that this takes all of us together doing it. And we are going to have to be the voices, the ones who are pushing these forward. So use us as inspiration if you can. Like I said, we're a microcosm of this. We need every community across this country, across this world to be acting in this multifaceted way that Dr. Lau talked about as the solutions. So thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate being here and I'm excited to hear some of the questions that come up with this. Well, thank you so much, Raphael, and thank you to all of our speakers for being with us today. We have time for a short Q&A, so please continue to submit your questions through the Q&A feature. We won't have time to get to all of them, but we will be passing them along to our panelists. And with that, I will pass this on to Liz and Shannon to run the Q&A. Thank you, Mia, and thank you to all the speakers. So I'm just going to go ahead and kick it off with something a little bit more timely. So I would just, I would just was wondering, how do you all think that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the amount of plastic slash waste entering our world's oceans? And then also, what kind of momentum do you think we need post-pandemic to refocus the efforts on mitigating waste from entering these vital ecosystems, as you all spoke about? And this is open to any of you all. I can take a first stab. Um, so there have been anecdotal evidence that there's more plastic waste generated and some, some numbers starting to come in that seem to show that there's more plastic waste being generated. So that's on the one hand. Actually, on the other hand, I think it seems like at least there's more news articles covering plastic use, particularly single use plastic because the pandemic has caused um, people to have to use more of these types of products to protect themselves or because they're shopping differently. So I feel that awareness actually might have increased in terms of the plastic pollution problem, which is good, um, but it's not enough. We need to do something about it. And um, when we talk to governments and companies, this is still one of the top priorities for them, not the top, because the pandemic is obviously the top priority for pretty much everyone right now. But they are still wanting to talk to us. About, like, what can we do? How do we think about this problem long term? What is our strategy? So for me, it's hopeful that this is a problem that will probably pick back up and gain its prominence again when we have a handle on the pandemic. Um, but we can't let up, we need to keep working on it. And I think, you know, conferences like these, the passion of the students here today will continue to put the pressure, like Raphael said, that will be needed for companies and governments to act. I can add, I think that there, it's been challenging with COVID and plastics in Hawaii. Uh, the, I mean, just the obvious things of seeing single use masks in our streams and on our beaches has definitely ticked up. The more insidious part that I've seen is that in our work, especially implementing Bill 40 or working on the Plastic Source Reduction Working Group, the plastics lobby is using COVID as a mechanism to say we need plastics to saying it's more sanitary, to saying that the economic struggle is so big that we can't possibly get rid of single-use plastics uh, and, and put people at a disadvantage. And, and it's sad because ultimately with small businesses, especially restaurants, getting rid of things like utensils, single-use utensils, would actually save them money if we moved to the format of not necessarily handing out compostable alternatives, but saying, Everybody at home, look inside your drawer. You probably have a hundred pieces of silverware. Put one of those into your backpack or into your bag. And we, we at the restaurant are not going to provide them anymore. That's the opportunity that lies within this, I think. So there is opportunity on this zero waste front to also talk about savings that can come uh, in a time when we have economic hardship. I hope that that's where the narrative goes and that's where we're trying to, to help move it. Yeah, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add. Um, agree completely. Uh, but I think the one thing I also want to note is that COVID has in so many ways kind of highlighted the problems with so many of our systems. And one of those as well is recycling. Um, recycling has had a number of problems, a lot to do with plastic for quite some time. And we're now starting to see uh, recyclers or waste managers refusing to accept uh, any plastic other than one or two or refusing to accept any plastic or, or simply stopping accepting recyclables in some places. And I think this is really an opportunity to, rather than keep trying to pour money into a system that isn't working, examine the problems that are causing it to not work, um, in particular single use plastic, um, and, and start creating solutions to, to deal with that. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much. This was so enlightening. And we have some questions from the audience. So I'll start off with one. Um, this one can go to either um, Stephen or Winnie. Um, so how can we incentivize plastic polluting industries so that they pursue better waste management? What are the best channels to achieve this? I actually want to maybe change the question a bit to rather than incentivizing um, companies to have better waste management, actually for them to reduce generating the plastic waste to begin with. And one of the reasons is we're actually in a very huge hole with respect to the waste amount of waste generated and the way the capacity to properly treat it. So the hole is very big now, as I showed you. 2 billion people, no waste collection systems. And just so that we don't think this is a problem only for middle and low income countries, even in wealthy countries like the US, in rural areas, not all communities have full waste management services. So the, the, think of the, then, so the way to think about this is not about how do we collect more waste, it's about how do we generate less waste. And there are different ways of doing that. You know, don't don't use them unless there is absolutely no other alternative. Um, make sure that they are recycled, and and then also you know ensuring that there's budget for the waste management at the end of it. So I would say focus on redu reduction first because the hole is cannot be dug bigger. And, and to give a specific example, um, one policy proposal that I mentioned that is also included in the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, um, which was introduced into Congress this session in the US, um, includes extended producer responsibility. So essentially, for those products that have you know, disposable packaging, um, assigning a cost to that and actually imposing a cost on producers. And making them legally responsible for actually managing what waste they produce. And so that both, you know, gets you on, it, it's a funding mechanism and gets you on the collection side, but also is a very direct incentive to redesign packaging because, or redesign products, because if you can design a product or create a new distribution system, you can avoid those fees. Um, so that's just one example of a number of different components in in that legislation and, and elsewhere. Thank you all for that insight. So just to wrap up here on a more positive note, um, finally, I just want to ask, uh, what gives you all hope um, in working on these issues that are quite heavy? And then where do you expect to see the most positive change? I can start. I think that one of the, the biggest things that I see, we work so much with the youth and the next generation, whether that is millennials or the youngest of generations currently, they get it. This isn't something that's really challenging for them to understand. They understand that plastic pollution is affecting their, their beaches, their environment. They also understand climate change and that this is not a divisive political issue. This is going to be something that 
across the board, no matter what your thoughts are in politics, I think that there is a unanimous understanding of climate change and plastic pollution in the next generation, that it won't be questioned or divided. So the solutions are there with those generations to take action. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. <laughs> sure. Um, I, what, what makes me happy, and I, I agree completely with Raphael, that the, a combination of two factors really, really makes me feel motivated and, and good. Um, first is just, I have not seen um, a movement like this or awareness like this for any other environmental issue gain this kind of momentum this quickly. The way that the uh, ills of the plastic crisis are being understood and are being addressed both at the, in policy, in corporate commitments, in personal behavior, in everything. It's moving really, really fast because people get it. But what's extra exciting, I think, is that it's not just that people get, you know, the piece of plastic is bad in the environment or in the park. It's that this is a really interconnected web of problems, including obviously marine pollution, including climate change, including effects to human health and endocrine disruption, and including profound issues of environmental injustice where uh, petrochemical facilities and fossil fuel production is located. And the folks working on plastic are working on all of those things uh, and working together in a way that is, that is truly inspiring. And I'll follow Stephen and say I agree with both what Raphael and Stephen said. Uh, I'll add one piece, which is based on the work we have done, which is, as I said, we have much of the solutions. So it's a matter of choosing to implement them rather than needing to wait for some new invention to come up to help us. So, so I, I don't want to say it's easy, but I think the, the hardest part of having solutions, um, we've, we're past that. So being able to actually say we want to do it and then just go do it, that makes me hopeful. And, um, and I can't emphasize enough, you know, having the passion of uh, young people, like putting together these, this conference and other conferences makes me have even more hope. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us here today. It has been super amazing to have you all here with us. This panel, as I mentioned, will be recorded and it will be posted online on the conference webpage for anyone to see about mid next week. The link will be available for people who did not register as well. So please share it with your friends and colleagues who might be interested in this topic. In this same meeting room at 1.20 p.m. EST will be the Marine Natural Carbon Solutions Panel. So please enjoy a quick break and then be back here in just a few minutes. And the Societal Adaptation Planning and Resilience Panel will be at 1.20 Eastern time in meeting room B. And I will send the link out in the chat. So thank you so much for joining. It was so wonderful to have you all here with us today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.